Good morning. Uh, I'm Ian Lesser from GMF here in Brussels, and it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this conversation here today, and, and also a very warm welcome to those who've joined us online. Um, GMF's mission is very simple. It's to strengthen transatlantic cooperation. And I think you'll agree with us that uh, the issues we're going to speak about today are really at the core of transatlantic relations, uh, especially at the moment we find ourselves in uh, today. Uh, we have two extremely distinguished uh, speakers with us today, part of this conversation. And it's also a great pleasure for me to introduce um, my colleague, uh, Karen Kornblue, who is a uh, former US ambassador to the OECD and also director of GMF Digital, who will moderate the conversation. I'll let uh, Karen introduce our speakers. Uh, but also let me mention uh, before we start that uh, you can um, take part in the question and answer via the app of Slido, which you'll find a card on your seat that'll tell you a little bit more. So anyway, thank you again for joining us. Karen, over to you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming uh, today. And thank you so much to our distinguished guests. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here. We're going to have a discussion, I think, a really rich discussion on the implications of the current geopolitical landscape on transatlantic cooperation in the technology space. Our, our two speakers obviously don't need an introduction, but I'm going to try a very quick one anyway. Uh, Sundar Pichet is the CEO of Google. He's also the CEO of its parent company, Alphabet and he serves on Alphabet's Board of Directors. And Federica Mogherini is the Rector of the College of Europe. And of course, you know she served as the High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, as well as Vice President of the European Commission. And almost as important, she was a GMF Fellow at one point. So Started all there. <laughs> <laughs> it started there. So I'm going to um, start with an opening question for each of you. Uh, to give us your, your thoughts, and then we'll set the table with a conversation back and forth. And then, as Ian said, you can ask questions uh, with this app, Slido. So, um, uh, Sundar, I wanted to turn it over to you. I know you just came from Poland, and we're very eager to hear about that. But, but just to ask a question to start off, tech companies, and particularly Google, um, have talked about how, how technology can play a positive role in the world, and we're seeing that so clearly with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We see, on the one hand, uh, cyber attacks and disinformation, but we're also seeing um, positive hacking and uh, needed information documenting war crimes. How, as CEO of Google, you know, what do you see the, the role of a tech company at this time, and especially your tech company? Well, first of all, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I've been obviously it's an extraordinary time to be here in Europe and in the region. Uh, you know, it's one thing to follow the news from the U.S., but the closer you get to Ukraine, you feel it more. Uh, I was in Warsaw yesterday, and uh, going there, you know, we had opened up. We have opened up about three weeks ago our space there. We have a Google for Startups campus, and we have opened it up to uh, NGOs as well as uh, Ukrainian entrepreneurs, uh, some of whom have come over there. And, and being there, uh, one of the meetings I had, uh, there was an entrepreneur who was video conferencing in from, from Kyiv. And you know, so gave me a first-hand sense of the dedication and the commitment uh, people of Ukraine have and the resolve they have to, make, to, to fight for and make a difference. So it's an extraordinary moment uh, you know, as a company for us uh, you know, maybe there are four broad buckets. Obviously, it starts with making sure our products are working well and helpful. Uh, you know, massive use cases around, uh, you know, people looking for uh, what, what we call crisis-related information. Uh, to give you one specific example, we have rolled out in Ukraine air raid alerts in Google Maps. Uh, you know, a touching anecdote I heard yesterday was someone writing back saying, they got an alert two minutes earlier than the official app uh, prompted them. So being able to get those moments right, I think, I think as a company we are very, very focused on. Many examples of Polish families uh, hosting refugees and using Google Translate to try and talk back and forth, and countless examples like that. Um, you know, on a more serious note, cybersecurity has been a big focus. Uh, we, we have a threat analysis group. We have been able to thwart attacks. We have really provisioned many accounts uh, for Ukrainian governmental officials during the past three weeks and making sure <coughs> we are protecting those accounts and being able to function well. 
Uh, and so that's been a big focus. Raising authoritative information uh, you know, has been a massive focus and fighting disinformation as well, including obviously we are complying with EU sanctions. We have really removed uh, uh, you know, uh, Russian state news media content globally. But more importantly, I think search and YouTube are still available in Russia as well. And being able to, you know, we, we talked about Radio Free Europe, and these are all channels, you know, still accessible within Russia through YouTube. So that's an important part of the role as well. That's fascinating. Yeah. So we'll talk more about that. Um, Federica, Europe, Europe has responded to the crisis in, in dramatic fashion, and um, in, both in terms of international partnerships, but also in terms of political uh, agreement. And so I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on, on this moment in Europe and what it means for Europe going forward. Well, first of all, uh, it's a sad moment for Europe because uh, um, obviously we never thought, and especially my generation, that we would have seen war on the European continent again. Uh, there was war, war in the Balkans. Uh, and uh, after that, we thought that would have not happened again. And it was a, a war of a different nature. Uh, so I think that, all in all, nobody could say it's a good moment for Europe. But in this uh, dramatic moment for Europe, the European Union has reacted well. Um, uh, Jean Monnet said that, uh, he used to say that uh, uh, the European Union will be forged uh, through the responses it will be able to give through crisis. And if I have to say, the response to the pandemic and the response to the war in Ukraine uh, gave a picture of the European Union that is very different from the picture you could have had just five, six years ago in 2016 after the UK referendum on Brexit. You might remember many were saying this is the beginning of the end. Well, clearly not. Having said that, um, in Italy we would say, um, okay, Europe is the reaction to crisis enough. <laughs> we would uh, maybe now need a time for consolidation and, uh, and, um, and uh, we would probably enjoy a time without so many heart crises. But I guess that this war is uh, here to stay with us for a while. And I think it is extremely important that uh, this happens in a moment where not only the European Union internally, but also the transatlantic community mm -hmm. has managed to come together and respond together. Because when the transatlantic community comes together in this response, it's also the pillar for the international cooperation to gather and align. And this is really fundamental, not only for Europeans, obviously for Europeans, but I think also for Americans. And Sundar, you mentioned uh, disinformation, and I know that conspiracy theories are something that Google has grappled with for a long time. And COVID, but also this uh, current crisis, are really bringing these issues into, into sharp focus. Um, how do you see the role of Google and, and what do you plan to do uh, now and going, f going forward, both in terms of the disinformation, the propaganda, the extremism, but also, as you mentioned, in terms of providing access to information, to free media, and so on? No, you know, it's, it's at the heart of what our mission as a company is, what Google Search has been about. And uh, over time across Search and YouTube, in all these moments, there are two, two parts to it, right? You know, how do you raise what we think of as authoritative information? Uh, information from news organizations, information from uh, third party, uh, you know, organizations which are generally considered experts in these areas. And so we do a lot of work around that. Uh, disinformation has been a big focus for us. Uh, I was, you know, as part of the Poland visit, you know, I had a chance to meet with uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki and Prime Minister Jansha. Uh, and you know, talking about disinformation in the CE region, uh, which is a particular uh, focus focus for all of them, and you know, we announced a ten million dollar investment to partner with think tanks and fact checking organizations to get more high quality uh, information and counter information to misinformation. So it's an ongoing process. You know, you have to constantly adapt and evolve to each crisis. Uh, but the good good thing around this is. We are seeing plenty of evidence too, to your earlier point, uh, you know, in YouTube, etc., of people really reporting from Ukraine, being able to get facts from the ground quickly on. And so the positive use cases of information flowing has been uh, great to see as well. And uh, Federica, um, what do you see as the role, you know, from your perch as a, as a national security foreign policy person, what do you see as the role of tech companies in fostering democracy? 
and especially this issue of access to information um, and freedom of expression? Uh, it's a key role and, you know, looking back at the time when I was in office, um, digital and tech was considered to be nice to have a little bit side issue for foreign and security policy it was the core obviously of digital itself and, and economic and trade but mainly for security and, and, and defense issues uh, it was all about traditional, a lot about, not all but a lot about traditional military approach, uh, not only military but also civilian, but still the field of security and defense was felt as completely separate yes. from digital and tech. And I think that today, if we look at the reality of things, uh, especially in Europe but not only, you realize that when you talk about strategic autonomy, you talk about energy, yes. digital uh, infrastructures uh, and communication, uh, mainly. Uh, so I think that the key role of uh, digital platforms and tech companies is fundamental, not only for the access to information, but also for uh, cybersecurity and uh, for the safety and security of our lives. Not only if we look at a war, but also if you look at the two years of pandemic, how could have we survived without the digital platforms? And yet there is an issue, uh, and that is that the digital and tech world doesn't have a governance place. There's no uh, physical, by definition, area, uh, and there is no authority um, globally that is aimed and has the competence and the power to, if I say regulate, this sounds too much, but in any case, to, to ensure that there is a common framework, um, both to limit the potential damages, yeah. but also to foster the positive actions that can be made, and, and they are enormous. And I think that, again, it's, it's my German Marshall Fund fellowship that comes back. Again, I think that if Europe and the United States, and in general terms, the transatlantic community comes together also to reflect on how to provide some elements of governance, uh, both to provide boundaries, but also to empower. Uh, that would be not only useful for the moment, but also useful for the relationship itself, and probably also for the companies. You know, I mean, I, I think you're raising a good issue about governance. I think there's a lot of progress within the EU. Uh, the EU Code of Disinformation, uh, you know, is an, is an important step. And I think, I think trying to bring a good framework uh, mm. around, around rules and practices uh, around, around the flow of information. So I think it's an important process. Obviously, we're in the middle of uh, you know, legislation around uh, DSA, which, yes. which I uh, also think ends up playing, playing an important role. And so I think, I think there are ways by which we can make progress. I think, uh, I think to your point, Federica, it's important that these are based on uh, foundational uh, liberal democratic values. And, 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 and I think there's a lot to be gained in terms of working on these transatlantically as well. And I'm sure we'll talk about it more. Yeah, well, uh, why don't I just pick up on that? I mean, the, the US e EU Tech and Trade Council, I always get that mixed up. I don't know if it's trade and tech or tech and trade. I, I like to put tech first. But um, do you see that that's a, um, a vehicle that could maybe foster some common approaches that, as you say, could be agreed upon in the transatlantic setting, but then taken maybe internationally? Not to have one body that regulates, but to have the beginnings of an interoperable framework. You go first. <laughs> you know, I, well, first of all, I'm really encouraged. Uh, you know, we, we started the conversation talking about Ukraine, and I think it's been a real moment of, uh, you know, strengthening transatlantic alliance in a way in which it's been heartening to see. Uh, you know, going in Poland right after President Biden had visited there, and you saw how much uh, that moment meant. Uh, and I, I, I think we would need the same digitally. You know, when I look at areas like you know, if you were to think about the threats of the future, uh, you know, we are going to be dealing with extraordinary threats around cybersecurity and, and cybersecurity threats leveraging AI. And, and so for, for us to be able to tackle problems like that, I think we're going to need real strong transatlantic cooperation and, and frameworks. And so I'm encouraged by uh, TTC, uh, you know, credit to the leadership of EVP Vestire and EVP Domrosk is to get it, getting it all started. I think serves as a good foundation. I think there are a lot of complex issues to tackle. Uh, coming into this week, I'm really heartened to see the privacy shield 
you know, uh, uh, you know, with the new proposal, new agreement. Uh, I think that's an important framework. It's super important to preserve transatlantic data flows in a way that's consistent with the EU fundamental rights. Uh, but we all need to do the hard work to strengthen an open internet. And you know, this is also a moment in which the internet, there are forces which are splintering the internet as we are working our way through all this as well. So it's an important moment, and I think the more we can do to strengthen transatlantic alliances over the next many years digitally, it's going to be very important. Yes, I, I, I agree, and I think that this was really something that was missing. Uh, we were focusing before on, on trade, yeah. trying to get a trade agreement. Well, I'll leave that behind. Uh, but uh, I, I perfectly remember during the, the five years of man that, for instance, uh, that also coincided with the change of administration that was quite dramatic in the United States. Uh, we established, for instance, a small, completely informal uh, global tech panel, uh, actually to bring together uh, tech companies across the world and, and uh, some, um, not only um, governance experiences, but even security and military even experiences, exactly to fill in a gap of where do we sit to discuss issues that are common concern or common opportunities. How do we discuss uh, how we use artificial intelligence in the militaries, for instance? Is it the UN framework the right one? Clearly not, because it goes immediately to the Security Council and it's China and Russia and it gets yeah. stuck. Uh, is it uh, NATO? Not really, because it's not only the Transatlantic Alliance military. Just an example. So I think that the TTC can offer the place and the instruments to bring the two sides that are not two, but are many more, because each of the sides has different stakeholders and it's not only the, the governance element, there's also the private sector and the, the other stakeholders coming together and trying to find a common framework. I think this is essential, again, for different reasons. I think that the different working groups clearly identify the ramifications of this work that can go in all different directions. I see it with my students at the college. Um, I don't think I exaggerate if I say that um, some 30-40% of them are focusing their thesis and their researches on this field which, I mean, for those of you that know the College of Europe, is extraordinarily new because mm -hmm. normally they're all lawyers fix, fixated with competition law. Not all of them, but many. Uh, the others are diplomats. But uh, uh, to say that uh, it's clearly an issue that is going to be the centre of all the other fields of work we're going to tackle. Just to share with you a data I was just looking at uh, yesterday, um, uh, uh, cybersecurity attacks against uh, European Union entities in the last two years has gone up 10 times. How do we tackle that? Is it only against the European Union? Is it against the European Union and the member states? Is it against the West, the transatlantic community? How do we tackle these issues in an effective manner? I don't think this is only a technical question. I think it is a political question. It's a security issue. And we cannot do it without a strong alliance, not only across the Atlantic, but also private public. That's a, a great segue, and I did want to ask you about cybersecurity because it's on all of our minds. We've been holding our breaths, uh, waiting for a big cybersecurity attack. There have been some, but I wonder what you think, especially in Europe, what more could be done on the cybersecurity front? An extraordinarily important area. Uh, you know, I was in Madrid uh, two days ago, and uh, many years ago, Google had uh, bought a small company in Malaga, and you know, it's turned into a uh, you know cybersecurity center for us. Uh, but the demand, you know, I'm seeing from European companies, uh, they're all thinking about how do they strengthen uh, their companies, uh, you know, IT security and overall uh, gear up for what's ahead. And it's literally on the top of mind of most CEOs I meet. And, you know, so we, I mean, it's a major area of investment for, for us as a company. We've come into $10 billion over the next five years additionally to focus on cybersecurity. And, and for me, the areas we are really beginning to think about are how do you plan for cybersecurity in a world where AI is much more effective? And so that's where most of our R&D is going into. Google, just as a, you know, in 2009 as a company, in retrospect, I think it was an early warning call. We were, uh, you know, attacked as a company by, uh, you know, by, a, uh, by uh, uh, you know, an attack originating from China. And so... Getting the company breached was a wake-up call for us, so we developed uh, many new cybersecurity principles, including what we call a zero trust. What we mean by that is anyone using uh, anything to do with Google IT, including Google employees, 
Uh, fundamentally, you don't trust uh, and you authenticate based on the circumstance. It's a continual assessment of uh, the risk and, you know, and providing access for it. So we've been investing in world-class cybersecurity efforts now for well over a decade. And using Google Cloud, uh, we are beginning to offer it to companies around Europe. Uh, in a partnership with governments is uh, very important. And finally, I would say in cybersecurity, having agreements across countries is an important framework. Uh, we've seen in the past bilaterally, when the US would engage with another country, we would see threats originating from that country go down. So, you know, I would say it's no different from trade or something like that. You would need to put in the same energy around cybersecurity and over time develop global uh, frameworks and, you know, and, and mutual uh, assured uh, protections to make progress in this area. And you, you talked about cybersecurity already, but is there anything more you want to add about what companies and governments could do together on cybersecurity? I'm afraid I'm not the right person to indicate this. <laughs> My daughters would argue that I'm a digital analphabet, so it's probably <laughs> not for me to do that. Uh, but uh, uh, but what, what I see is, uh, is the need to focus more on that. So for sure, companies are focusing a lot on that already. That's your job. Uh, it's not only your job because you can be attacked, but also because you can provide the rest of the world. Uh, answers and, and instruments for that, so it's also business for you. Uh, but from a political point of view, I think uh, uh, we still need uh, to focus much more on uh, the risks that are related to cybersecurity. I have the impression that still, even in these days, in these dramatic weeks, we're living, uh, I hear a lot about the return to the traditional forms of warfare, mm -hmm. which is true, dramatically true. Uh, we have spent years, if not decades, talking about hybrid threats and, uh, and thinking that the military aspects, the mi traditional uh, military aspects of the 20th century approach to war was, was gone. Clearly not. Uh, but I, I hope that this need also to increase military uh, expenses and investments does not shift our focus from the new threats that are not new anymore, and that could even be multipliers of the traditional threats that we're facing on the military side. So I hope that uh, the public and political attention, uh, especially in Europe, doesn't shift away from uh, the need to invest resources, financial, human resources, R&D, uh, on, uh, on cybersecurity and hybrid threats. Um, because unfortunately, we live in times where one threat doesn't take away the other. They multiply each other. Uh, and. Um, if you think again of the use of artificial intelligence that can be applied to military sector, it's very scary to me. It's very scary to me. Not only for the effects on the war, but also uh, on uh, all the ethical implications, the chain of command, who is responsible for what, accountability. Yeah. So I, I really hope and I really think that together with the increase of focus on the, I would say, traditional, mainly NATO related development of our military capabilities, we will also consider, let's put it this way, cybersecurity as a military capability, as a defense capability that is vital and core to our security transatlantically. Great. Um, I want to shift, I know we'll come back to the security issues, but I want to shift before we're done with our conversation to some of the economic development, economic growth, job creation, social issues. And in Europe, there's been quite a focus on digitalization, mm -hmm. and um, especially during the years of the COVID, um, businesses have been adopting all kinds of new technologies. And maybe you could talk to us a little bit about what Google is doing with businesses to help them adopt some of these technologies. We talked about AI in the military context, but AI in the economic context. And also there's this other aspect, just as there's there in the military with, is there a man in the middle? How do you assure people that, that the AI is fair, that they can understand what it is when it's being used and deployed in the economic setting? You know, two parts. Let me talk about the economic opportunity. I briefly mentioned cloud. You know, so the biggest opportunity is you know Europe's industrial economy making the digital transformation, and us and other companies are you know playing a role. And I think that's an important way in which you help. I would talk about SMBs. Uh, you know, it's the engine of uh, of the economy. I think coming from Spain, you know, I would say I think it's maybe 60, 70 percent of the economy and making sure the SME sector is able to transform digitally. And a lot of it is around skilling, training, 
giving them tools, including AI-based tools, to help them make the transition digitally. And I think it's got to be a focus for governments as well. Digitally skilling people uh, you know, is one of the most important things we have to do. And to be able to do it uh, mid-career way, I think, you know, and I think that will be increasingly a big part of every country has to tackle. How do you take large sections of your population and be able to transition them, reskill them effectively? And so thinking through programs, uh, through COVID, as a company, we trained 10 million people in, in Europe on digital skills. Uh, one example of that, we are working with the European Commission's Pack for Skills program. We have a Google Career Certificate program. So in nine months, you can get trained in an area like IT, uh, IT support, get credentialed, and, and be able to find employment after. And you know, over 50% uh, of these things are being used by underrepresented groups uh, in, in these countries. So scaling all of that up uh, is an important part. And I think the public-private partnership uh, is an extraordinary opportunity there. On AI, you, know, uh, you mentioned about this too. I think it's such an important area. We have articulated a responsible AI framework, uh, AI principles. We have publicly committed to them. And I agree with you that it needs to be tackled at a much higher level, uh, you know, from a, from a different standpoint, from, from a, a shared alignment across country standpoint. And there's a lot more that needs to happen there as well. So um, Sundar brought up uh, education, and that's your field now. Um, you know, the last you see few me years... much more relaxed. <laughs> Well, the last few years have been really hard, though, on students, especially in higher education. And how do you see um, their use of technology and their, the skilling that they need to have? How is that picking up? And what, what do you see as the challenges and opportunities for today's students? Uh, I think students are fine with that, uh, for the skilling, for sure. Uh, the point is uh, the middle career mm -hmm. reskilling that we need to put in place, because I see that people. I'm, I'm 48. People around my age need to, and, and over, need to readapt to different skills uh, that are needed, and even to understanding that they are needed. Uh, I think COVID is in this, has been, in this sense, a great opportunity to push the digitalization agenda in places that would have been resistant, like academia. Um, and it is true, you cannot substitute in person with digital altogether. There are things that you pass through contact, eye contact, body language, a chat over coffee, that doesn't happen over a screen. Uh, but this doesn't mean that you can develop both. You can keep the good of the past and you can, you can introduce the good of the future. Well, actually the present, not the future anymore. So I think it, it is a great opportunity to uh, raise uh, awareness and I would say even the need to, um, to, to reskill, uh, and not only in academia, in education, but in SMEs, SMEs, I think it's going to be a main challenge uh, because the, the smaller the size of a company or, or an institution, the more difficult it is to retrain and, and readjust and digitalize. Uh, also with the anxieties of losing jobs or, or uh, uh, not protecting, uh, socially protecting enough certain categories. This is a very important element for, for Europe, for sure, but I think also for the United States. Um, and I've seen that is in the... Uh, TTC quite highlighted this need yes. to protect the middle class and uh, and the SMEs uh, and and somehow the social standards uh, we, we 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 can protect, but from an educational point of view, I see this on one side as an opportunity. Obviously, uh, we can really push for digital digitalizing educational institutions across Europe. But also, uh, I think this is an opportunity for the younger generations to realize that digital is cool. Uh, but only digital is a nightmare <laughs> because they've lived uh, part of this last two years. At the college we've been lucky because we've managed, we've been also good, not only lucky, we've managed to keep the students on site all the time. Wow. We never sent them back. But um, even being on site with your fellow students and follow classes online for two or three months is somehow alienating. Uh, so I think that this is also a wake-up call uh, mm. for this generation uh, that spending all your time on your mobile phone um, might not be so fancy anymore because you've been forced to do it so much. And now, if you can, you go out. Uh, and maybe before, you didn't. Um, my older daughter um, tells me, I, now after COVID, I don't, I don't want to spend more than 24 hours in my, in, at home. I, want, I need to go out. 
uh, before, sometimes you have to just drag it out <laughs> and, and disconnect. I think that, again, it's a big opportunity. It has been a big opportunity. Companies, SMEs, uh, educational institutions to realize the need to digitalize and do it yeah. properly and put the adequate resources on this. But also, I think it's, it has been a wake-up call and, and a good opportunity for the younger generations to realize that digital is literally life-saving. They wouldn't have done anything without digital in these last two years. But that life is outside, which is healthy. That's great. That's great. Um, and you know, an example here where we felt the need to get together yes, in person, and it does feel really and, nice. And, to and be the hybrid. People. And the hybrid. It, it is so nice much. to be able to. I've done so many virtual. <laughs> these things it makes a big difference yeah it really does it really does um, so I just wanted to um, probe a little bit on this one issue which is um, European uh, strategic autonomy digital sovereignty um, we hear a lot about it there's there have been a number of um, laws that are being contemplated and also put in place um, you know we talked a little bit about the Tech and Trade Council but in general at this issue of strategic autonomy I'd love you both to to talk about it and, and what you see as the challenges and opportunities and how the US and EU can work together on these you want issues. me to start on this <laughs> fair enough uh, you know I, I would not comment on specific uh, regulations or laws and uh, there are others in the room that could do it better than me and I don't represent the European Union institutionally anymore so I'm uh, and I left office uh, too recently to comment on, on what is done now. So I, I, I keep this, uh, this comfortable place. But uh, on strategic autonomy and, and sovereignty in general terms, not necessarily connected to digital, I think there has been some misunderstandings or some, sometimes some intentional misunderstandings on both sides about what it is and what we mean about strategic autonomy. I think that is quite clear if you look at the etymology of the term, I'm sorry, I'm a humanist. Uh, and it means basically to uh, determine your own rules. And the contrary of this is that your own rules are determined elsewhere, which is something nobody else of us would even conceive nowhere, neither in Europe nor the United States. Uh, so it, goes without, it should go without saying. Uh, the concept of strategic autonomy sometimes has been um, interpreted, especially in, in outside of the European Union, in Washington in some times, and, and maybe in London sometimes, as something that could be uh, used against or to, 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 to uh, make the ocean uh, broader uh, and, and, and more difficult to cross. I think that in reality of facts, uh, the, the strongest the European autonomy is, uh, the strongest the transatlantic bond can be. Because autonomy is not against, I think it's not against anyone, but for sure it's not against the United States. Today, the strategic autonomy of Europe is uh, autonomy from Russian gas. As simple as that. Uh, or uh, from, from a digital point of view, a tech point of view, um, uh, from the Chinese investments uh, on, on the tech and digital fields in Europe just to mention two elements. So the more the European Union manages to strengthen its autonomy, the more it is in conditions to partner solidly with the United States. Uh, and without having this idea that Europe is necessarily the junior partner, there are fields where Europe can play its autonomous role. And this is perfectly matching with a strong partnership with the United States. Yet there are some issues and there are some areas that can be problematic. Now, I don't talk about digital here. I talk about, for instance, the military field. Indeed, if the European Union invests or EU member states invest more and more together on uh, military capabilities, for instance, this might uh, have an impact on the US investments in Europe on the military capabilities. But it's, this, is, this is an industrial consideration. It's not a security consideration. Uh, obviously, the two are related. but. Yet it's fair. So I think that um, indeed there is an added value for the transatlantic community in having a European Union that is more autonomous in different sectors, knowing that the bond is so strong. Again, here is my fellowship uh, probably that speaks, but the bond is so strong that has resisted so much through even this difficult last few years uh, that I don't think that in any way a stronger autonomy of the European Union could ever, ever, ever challenge or threaten or put in danger or weaken 
uh, the transatlantic bond, on the contrary. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's even a basic element of psychology, not even applied to institutions. The stronger your identity is, the more you're open and able to interact and partner with others. The weaker you feel, uh, the more difficult it is to build true partnerships. So I think that investing in the European strategic autonomy in all fields, in all fields, is an investment also in the transatlantic bond. That's fascinating. Did you want to add to that? You know, may I very much agree uh, with what you said, and I think it's really important for Europe uh, to to uh, invest, uh, make progress in the digital transformation, uh, and to feel leadership there. I think it matters to every country, uh, and and you know I think it's uh, you know we as a company feel aligned with that, right? I think in, in pretty much every place we operate in. Uh, you know, we want to play a strong role in helping uh, those countries, continents, uh, you know, make that transition digitally. And I, you know, so it, it makes sense to me. Uh, and I think it also makes sense to me that, you know, uh, you, you want a way to protect your citizens, have clear rules. And so all of that uh, makes sense to me. I do think it's important through it uh, to make sure we don't, uh, we work hard to preserve an open, interoperable internet uh, in a way that works. And I think that is a strength uh, you know, uh, as well. And so I think, I think both are important. And I think, but you can balance that. But I, but I agree with you. I think a stronger digital economy would lead to a better partnership uh, over, time, uh, over time. And so you know, I, th I think it's good to see that. Great. So I'm, I'm going to turn to some of the questions from the audience. And uh, the first question is, it's, it, it asks in the context of the Trade and Tech Council, but it brings up this important issue of climate change that I think it would be a good idea to address. I mean, what this question asks is, what role can the Trade and Tech Council play in solving global problems like climate change, effective digital regulation, democracy? But I think we can, I think it's big enough if we just talk about climate change and, uh, and how you see playing out both in the transatlantic relationship, but also, um, you know, given the challenges that we're facing right now, especially in the energy field. Yeah. Uh, clearly, I mean, um, this is a clear priority for the European Union. Uh, no mystery about that. I think that what is interesting to see is that the priorities that were set up at the beginning of this institutional cycle in the EU, uh, digital transformation and, uh, and, and the green um, uh, transition, uh, climate change uh, related uh, um, decisions, uh, keep being on the top of the agenda even after or through a pandemic and a war, uh, which means that they were solid priorities. And, and this is for different reasons. It's a safety and security reason, uh, but it's also an economic reason, uh, the, the need to transform the European um, economies uh, in in a green uh, in a green direction, uh, and I think that it is quite clear that Europe can can try to can strive to do this uh, alone. Uh, it has had to do it at a certain moment when the U.S. administration pulled out of the climate change uh, Paris Agreement, for instance, had to. But it clearly works much better if we do this together. It, it, it's, it's so obvious that it's even banal to say, but I think that's a, a partnership between the European Union, or at least a forum where uh, the European Union and the United States can discuss in particular how digital and green can go together. Uh, and there are clearly um, bridges and interactions that can, um, can act as, uh, um, as uh, amplifiers, uh, one of the other. Um, is, is the right place to, to tackle this because uh, I think the two sides of the Atlantic on this aspect are naturally aligned and like-minded. We might have bumps on the road, as we had, <laughs> let's put it this way, uh, maybe an understatement, but uh, uh, we over managed to overcome them. And I think for the Europeans, I think it's the most natural to do, thing to do to, to, to work on, uh, on, uh, on the climate change-related policies together with the United States. And again, this relates to the digital agenda, but also to the, to the other agenda, starting from the energy one, for sure. But I think digital can offer a great opportunity for us to work together in this field. You know, I mean, I, I think on climate, uh, I think, you know, Europe clearly is in a, uh, has the potential to be in a strong leadership uh, position. 
you know, the Green Deal has been a huge step in the right direction. Uh, it's an area where, you know, as a company, we felt strongly for a long time. Uh, Google was Google became carbon neutral in 2007. Uh, and uh, so we've been carbon neutral for 15 years, but we've committed to be 24-7 carbon free, and which means you don't use offsets, uh, you operate. Uh, so our goal is every email you send or every YouTube video you watch or every query you do on search, that, you know, that we do it carbon free. And that transition is going to be an investment of billions of dollars, but we see Europe to be a very supportive place in which we can do many of those ideas first. Uh, already some of our data centers in Europe are the greenest we operate. And we see a huge opportunity to use AI to make a difference. Uh, to give an example of a public-private partnership, we are partnering with many European cities. Uh, you know, cities account for uh, you know, almost 60 to 70 percent of global emissions. And most cities don't have good insights into where their emissions are actually coming from. So it's a, it's a data problem, so giving them insights using AI, so we are partnering with, uh, and, uh, and actually many European cities are at the forefront of projects like this. So I see this as a big opportunity to use uh, digital technologies to help drive progress, and I think Europe uh, will be in the lead here. Great. Um, I, I, I'm going to combine two of these questions. There's a, a question about the Privacy Shield and the Digital Services Act. Um, and. Uh, and then just this, a, a third question actually on the fragmentation of the global internet. And I just wonder what you had meant, you'd already spoken about uh, Privacy Shield. It has a new name, I think, Transatlantic Data something. I think some people are calling it Tada, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is great. But, um, you know, what do you, you know, obviously there are repressive uh, governments, authoritarian regimes that would like to splinter the internet. Um, and uh, and then there are some very um, legitimate concerns about things like um, privacy and compelled government access and the Digital Services Act. How, how, how you know we talked about governance a little bit before, but maybe you could talk about the dangers you see of fragmentation, and then specifically how you see some of these very specific new um, agreements. Um, you know, how they're affecting the company and how, how and, effect, and affecting people's rights. Well, look, I think the biggest argument, I mean, if you believe in the benefits of global trade and, and the prosperity that it brings, making sure that happens in a digital context uh, is one of the biggest opportunities for many economies. I think in most countries, we are actually able to show how, you know, getting access for your companies, particularly SMEs, to participate digitally expands their markets, both within the country and over time internationally. Uh, and, uh, and, and so that, you know, that, that's one of the big benefits of uh, open free internet. And, and so you make the case for it. I think the more I mean, U US and Europe can lead, you know, set an example by forming strong transatlantic uh, alliances and frameworks. Uh, and I think helping, helping uh, you know, uh, amplify that tr through trade agreements. Uh, so I think those are all big opportunities to make progress here. And, and do you, do you, I think we talked about the privacy, the new privacy shield. I mean, do you, how, how can Europe, Europeans feel secure that their rights are going to be respected, that they're going to have due process? I know this has been quite a political issue in, in Europe, and there's some skepticism that, you know, with a political announcement, um, the, the details aren't going to come out for some time. That there's just concern about people's people's rights being respected as so much of this data uh, is in the hands of U.S. companies. I think uh, well, first of all, I think it is clear by now, and this has not always been understood. I think on the other side of the Atlantic, that this is not a political fixation of the European decision makers. This is a real concern of the European citizens, and this is why it has yeah. been tackled. Uh, sometimes there has been a little bit of a, a confusion of the focus here. Um, it is a real issue for European citizens, uh, protection of data, uh, and uh, I think uh, the European uh, Union uh, has uh, in the recent years shown, uh, let's put it this way, um, uh, sufficient boldness uh, to demonstrate to European citizens that they can trust them uh, on, uh, on these regulatory issues. Um, at the end of the day, um, the European Union is, is uh, well, it's good for many things. Um, 
I could list, sorry, I could list uh, hundreds of them, but for sure, there's no doubt that uh, when it comes to its regulatory capacity, uh, there's, there's absolutely um, no competition with others, probably, in the way in which the European Union authorities manage to regulate um, um, many different sectors. Sometimes European citizens even feel that it's too much in certain fields, where on data protection as well. And I think this is a reassuring element for the European citizens uh, that I believe uh, should be enough to reassure them uh, on the seriousness of the data protection when it comes to, to the European authorities. Yeah, it was a pretty robust sounding agreement. I, I was surprised at how, um, how it, it, it dealt with both sides of the, of the issue, the due process issue, but also um, uh, containing the collection. Mm -hmm. um, so Sundar, this is a question from a group called Allied for Startups. And it, um, it deals with AI, and it says you, you, mentioned, you once mentioned AI is the most profound technology humanity will ever work on. How can we, from startups to Google, harness AI to society's benefit? And then someone else asks also about AI. Is Google itself fundamentally changing due to AI? I mean, we see countless examples of uh, the positive uh, applications of AI. Uh, to give one example, uh, you know, uh, there is a condition called diabetic retinopathy. It's a, it's a major cause of blindness, but it's as long as you uh, identify it early, it's completely curable. Most places in the world don't have qualified physicians who can uh, who can diagnose it. You know, you can cure it with eye drops as long as you diagnose it. Using AI, smartphone, and a camera, you know, we are enabling. We have trials underway in places like India which will help, uh, you know, it affects over 3 million people annually. So we can give tangible, so I constantly see evidence uh, in many areas how using AI is going to profoundly impact it. And so I think so the benefits are clear to see. Uh, I think it will literally transform every sector over time, uh, over time. We see through Google today how many students, both through YouTube and Google, are, are, are trying to learn new things. And we see this in the query volume we get. Through the pandemic, educational-related content was one of the biggest growth areas we saw. So the promise of AI and technology to make a difference, to provide better tools across all sectors is, I think, very clear. We have to balance it to our earlier conversation with the bigger issues. We have to make sure we are approaching it responsibly and harnessing it overall uh, to the benefit of humanity. Uh, the second part of the question, I'm sorry, was... How is Google changing as a result of AI? And is it, is it dramatically changing? It, it, you know, it is, you know, one of the biggest decisions I made uh, as a CEO was to, you know, take an AI-first approach to everything we do uh, and, and, you know, applying it across all our products. And, uh, and, uh, and so to, to give one example, uh, you know, historically... Google has been about understanding the text in web pages and being able to answer your query. But over time, we are trying to understand audio content, video content, text. We think of this as multimodal uh, you know, work, and, and AI is what makes it possible. So whether something is spoken or something is a picture image or a video or text, being able to understand all that mm. and hence answer what users are looking for, that's done using AI. And, and so... Uh, you know, we think uh, another example, I think, is making universal global translation possible in the most seamless way possible will something uh, that will be done with AI in the next, next decade or so. And so these are all huge opportunities. And so we view this as a foundational technology. Not only are we applying it across all our products and services, we are taking it and giving it as a, a technology solution to companies outside. So we believe in doing that both. It's, it's a business opportunity for us, uh, and I also think it's equally good for the world. And I think, you know, we, we as a company, we have invested $100 billion in R&D in the last five years, and, and a lot of it goes into AI. So both working with governments, uh, public, uh, public institutions, nonprofits, and, and, and companies, big and small, to help drive transition using AI is a huge opportunity we see. And I, I want uh, one of the questions that came in, it was actually a question to Sundar, but I want to ask you, which is about, we've seen these huge disruptions from COVID and now the situation with Russia having invaded Ukraine. Do you, uh, uh, you must think in your university position about 
these kinds of disruptions and how, how different it is from when we thought it was the end of history. And I wonder what you think going forward, if you think there will be more disruptions and what kinds they will be and what kinds we should worry about, or, um, or do you think there will be a new equilibrium, or how, how, do, you, how do you approach this? What's next? This? Yes, I what's next? I don't want to steal this question from, <laughs> question from you. I'm very glad to give it to you. <laughs> you know, uh, I guess most of my students would answer this question saying, uh, Due to climate change, if not other things, yeah. 50 years from now we will all be dead, so don't worry about that. <laughs> Which is a very... I, I would laugh too, but if you take seriously research and science, it might be right. Uh, obviously, it's not an assumption on which you can build your daily work and studies and, and decisions, because uh, uh, human nature and commitment is made to build things that last over time, so if you think that it's going to be all over, uh, but it, it might be, for instance, a very good reason to take seriously the work on climate change, that yes. Uh, or on uh, weapons of mass destruction, for instance, because now we are realizing that, um, yes, we might be at risk even in Europe, not only for weapons of mass destruction, but also for the misuse of nuclear facilities uh, for very uh, traditional um, warfare plants. Uh, but if, if we want to take that part away uh, and, and only focus on the geopolitical trends, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm of a generation that has grown up with the idea of uh, you know, a global cooperation model and um, global governance, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, reform of the international governance system and uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, the 90s and, and, and then this millennium has started on a different note, definitely. What comes next, if we survive enough uh, in, in terms of decades and centuries, I think that we will have um, some years now of very tense uh, dynamics globally. Uh, I think this will last for, for some time, uh, also due to the complexity of the picture. Um, uh, but probably, uh, I'm an optimist, so probably uh, uh, at a certain point, uh, you know, nothing lasts forever, including leaderships and including political agendas. And at a certain moment, probably, the, the, the predominance of the urgencies that we are facing globally together uh, might prevail and push for some forms of global alliances that would be needed. I mean, if you take it rationally, and I know rationality is not always a part of the global politics, but if you take it rationally, Everything in this last few years tells us that we need international cooperation more than ever. Uh, the natural result of the pandemic v should have been more international cooperation and more global governance. Because it was clear for the first time ever, also, I mean, it was clear already for climate change, but for the pandemic even more so, that we can be safe here, but we're not really safe if next door you're not safe. Uh, if, if there's not enough vaccines in Africa, Europe is not safe, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, and that's research developed in one place can be used in another place, and that is useful not only for, for the others, but also for yourself. So it's not charity, it's, self in, it's investment in self-interest to invest in everybody's well-being. But this is the rationality part of it. What we're seeing today is actually the, the, the contrary trend. I think that there is a limit, again, provided that, the, that, that we manage to overcome uh, the, the climate change challenge, I think there is a, a temporal limit, a time limit, to the irrationality we can afford to have globally. And that at a certain moment, rationality and the need for international cooperation will prevail. But I guess we're not there yet, and it will take probably um, quite many years to get there still, I'm afraid. So I'm, I think I have time for one more question, and unfortunately it's a very philosophical question again, Sundar, so I'm going to give it to you, and you can answer it as you like or just give us a wrap-up question, a wrap-up answer. Large digital companies are disrupting traditional industries, the old telecom monopolies, publishing, uh, it says centralized energy models, um, political parties even, and this creates political tensions. Um, so again, this is a very big question. How should society mitigate these disruptions? Well, uh, you know, technology is a driver of change. Uh, I think the only thing constant about constant is that there will be change, and technology will progress, and 
and, and I think societies need to adapt to it. And, and I think it's always been a journey, how do you harness technology to, to society's benefit? We have to do it, do it with fire. We have to make sure fire works in a positive way. And uh, you know, so it'll always be true. So I see this is no different. In fact, part of the big conversations in Europe right now is around that. And you know, uh, how do you think about the rules of the road in a way in which technology, the digital sector, works to the benefit of European citizens? And I think that's what a lot of the conversation is about. And I think it makes sense to me. And and you know, that's what I would expect democratic societies to do. So uh, you know, the philosophical part of it is. It's always going to be true, and, and the problems only get harder over time. And so uh, the positive thing I would say is, I think just like climate, you cannot solve these things without globally arriving at uh, alliances and frameworks. That would be true for AI as well. There is nothing called unilateral AI safety. That is, just means nothing. And so over time, to get at uh, a safe world, we have to solve, solve it together. So that's. Perfect ending. Did you, did you have anything else to add? Perfect ending. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Thank you to the two panelists. I think this was such a great uh, conversation to put these tech issues. As you said, they're too often left out of the foreign policy and the national security issues. And I think to have a dialogue like this is really so rich and so important at a, at a time like this. Thank you very much for taking time in between your, your travels to, uh, to share your thoughts with us. Thanks, Kara. Thank you very much. Thank you.